book of Zechariah. Go to the book of Matthew, turn left two books. Um, we are in the book of Zechariah, the last, second to last book in the Old Testament. Chapter 10. <laughs> last week we stayed a little bit later because God decided to make it rain, which was good. So without rain tonight, we are going to be staying later because we got a lot of ground to cover. Um, this is, uh, there are things within these next three chapters, 10, 11, and 12, that really um, cause one to think. Um, we talk about the Antichrist. We'll be talking about the end of the time. We'll talk <laughs> about Jesus Christ. We'll talk about the millennial reign. We'll talk about the abomination and desolation, rapture. Everything is in these chapters. You guys had no idea Zechariah was so packed, did you? You guys like, who, who's, who's never read Zechariah before? Be honest. All right, good. Yeah, it's a good book to read. It's a heavy book. You know, people who come to this book, they kind of read it like, whoa, Zechariah, how do you pronounce that? You know, and anybody who puts a Z in the name of their children, bless them. <laughs> when I was in the Navy, I was, I was I deployed with a man. His name was Jason Dejazic. He had three Z's in his last name. So we just called him Z-Man. Made it easy. The nation of Israel, God's chosen people, were selected by God, groomed by God, grown by God, ministered by God, they were ministered to by God, given basic commands saying, hey, if you guys obey me and do these things that I ask you to do, it will be well. You'll be blessed. Things will happen in your favor. Your enemies will flee. You'll be protected. You'll never go hungry. You'll always have an abundance. It's, just, it's not going to be perfect, but do these things and it will go well. I'll bring rain. The animals will constantly be providing for you and all these good things. However, if you begin to backtrack and to start to fall away from me, bad things will happen. You will start to see your animals decline. You will start to see your children decline. You will be surrounded by enemies and you will be taken hostage. And Throughout the nation of Israel, their history is riddled with words like, everything you've said, we will obey. Yay. Kind of a false narrative. And they shortly thereafter fell into idolatry, fell into disobedience, and God many times brought the enemies. They would either surround the city, take them captive, or whatever it may be. But remember something. God never does that without warning. Every prophet that came onto the scene by God during the time prior to, long before the captivity, long before the battle, they would say the words that God told them to speak, saying, you're going the wrong direction, you need to change. And the heart of the people was negative, it was angry, it was like, we don't like your prophets. The prophets killed, they were killed. They were sawn in two lengthwise, they were cut, you know, beheaded, they were stabbed with swords, burned at the stake, drugged drawn and quartered, and just horrible deaths. And you just read about these men who tried to proclaim the truth of God, and yet God still brought judgment upon the nation of Israel. Now, on the flip side, when Israel repented, God brought mercy and grace. And there, there is a thing about God today that people have a very difficult time with, and that is the fact that he will judge people. And people don't like to hear that because he's supposed to be a God of love. He's supposed to be a God who shows compassion and mercy all the time, regardless. And what we find is the Lord just simply asks us, because what goes on in the nation of Israel back in its day is what reflects on us today. We know that when we obey God and we do the will of God, we're blessed. Whether it's individually, as a family, whether it's as a, as a nation, we're blessed. But the minute we begin to push God out and do things against God's will, things begin to happen on the negative side. And I don't know about you, but I have yet to find anything negative happening to us. Have you guys seen anything in the news? It's difficult for me to see something where God is not involved, where bad things happen. No, it, it takes two seconds. Watch the news. We have denied the living and true God as a nation. And sadly... The consequences of that denial are being seen today, all around the world, all around our nation, all around our cities. And now what we're going to see in chapter 10 is just basically a combination of when you obey God, good. If you disobey God, things happen in the negative side. So take a look at verse 1. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the fields for everyone. And oh, it's a good thing. Just... Obey me, ask for rain, and the rain will come. 
it'll happen. The latter rains too. And, and there was a latter rain when, this, when the harvest was done and everything was over with and the spring was coming close to an end. There would be a rain that would happen after the springtime that would help the crops or the latter crops grow. And the Lord is just saying, oh, just ask for it. And I want to give it to you. You'll have grass in your fields. You'll have flashing clouds, you know, and we know what that's like in Florida, don't we? You're driving down the road and all of a sudden the whole skyline lights up. It's like, driving down the road the other day with Christy and I looked over in the field and it was nothing but a huge bog. It looked like fog. And I'm looking at him going, that's a wall of water. There's a big wall there. So Christy looks over and she goes, whoo, there's a lot of rain. And we just see this. We, you know, we, we live in Florida. You know, we're either under a lot of rain or a lot of sun. But when you obey God, it's a good thing. And you ask it, I'll give it. Look at verse 2, though. The, now, he, now he backs up a little bit and he says, look, for the idols or the oracles, this word actually means oracle slash diviners, uh, speak delusion. That word is actually teraphim in the Hebrew, which is basically an oracle. And the, and the false gods, they used to build a life-sized idol, and then they would go talk to this thing. I don't know about you. Have you ever talked to a statue? I mean... You, you, you go overseas and you have all the fountain statues, you know, and all these things. You talk to them and they stare at you. I think the only thing those statues are good for are pigeons. You know, pigeons love statues. Pigeons talk to them. And I imagine what that statue says to the pigeon. But the human beings, when you talk to them, these oracles of idols, these teraphim, these false gods, look at this, they speak delusion or they speak lies. The diviners envision lies. They tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people win their way like sheep and they're in, they are in trouble because there is no shepherd. They leave the shepherd, the one who is God, and they follow all these diviners. And, and don't we see that today? Isn't there enough delusion in our nation, in our world today? Enough to cause you to go, wait a minute, why, why is that even being spoken? Why is that being said? And God gave us a brain. And this mind that he created is an amazing thing. And if we just used it for an hour a day, just an hour a day, and I'm not talking about trying to figure out the cheat codes on the game on the internet or on, you know, online. I'm talking about just think about something to find out is it real or is it false? And that should be the goal of a believer. What is being said that is fake and what is being said that is true? To know the truth, you have to read the truth. And the way that you read the truth is you pick up a Bible and you read it. And as you read it, you go, wow, this is full of truth. And so when I hear something that makes me question, there's a tick there, there's a question. It's like, I'm not sure about that. But the truth resounds. And you go, you know what, false dreams, they comfort people in vain. They try to tell you, it's all okay, don't worry about it. Is there much comfort in the world today? I don't know if you've been watching the news, but right now, a lot of people are trying to get out of Russia because he's reenacted the draft. And so people are fleeing Russia. It's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. It won't be that bad of a battle. Just, just come on. Just join us. And the people are fleeing Russia in droves. They're trying to get out, and yet they're not able to in many cases. But they're told it'll be okay but it's because they have no shepherd. They're seeking truth in the wrong place. They're looking for it outside of God. And then God speaks in verse three, my anger is kindled against the shepherds. I will punish the, the, the goat herds for the Lord of, Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them his royal horse in battle. The Lord will judge the shepherds. Now here's the thing, those in leadership in the nation of Israel were meant to lead people to God, not away from God. They were meant to comfort people with God's word, not to make people uncomfortable because of the truth. And here's the thing, when you're following the law, or you're following the truth, when you hear the truth, does it bother you? It never bothers you. It's when you're outside of the truth, when you hear the truth, that you start to get upset and angry. And all of a sudden you're going, ah, oh, how do I respond to that? Because now all of a sudden the light is shining on the deception or the light is shining on the darkness. And now suddenly there is a strange conversation and God himself says, my anger is kindled against the shepherds because the leaders are supposed to bring people to God. The Bible tells us that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. That's where it's going to begin. 
We'll talk about that when we get into the next couple of chapters. I'm going to do everything I can to stay off my soapbox tonight, I promise. But I will have to admit, I'm going to get on it once in a while, not to belabor a point, but just to show example. And he says, I'm going to punish the goat herds. The Lord of hosts will visit his flock. And look at this, the house of Judah. And he will make them as his royal horse in the battle. From him comes the cornerstone from him, the tent peg, from him, the battle bow, and from him, every ruler together. So you have the negative, his anger is kindled, but he tells the nation of Israel, I am going to bring you back. You know, the cornerstone in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, Isaiah wrote this. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a foundation stone a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believes shall not make haste. And there is a stone. That stone, that foundation is Jesus Christ. And that's what we see there. He also wrote in Isaiah chapter 22, and when you see, and, and Isaiah was just a great writer. He says in Isaiah chapter 22, the key house of, it says, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and no one will open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. We have a stone, the cornerstone. We have a peg that is used to hang things on. Who is he speaking about here in Zechariah? He's speaking about the Messiah. He's speaking about Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, that peg that is put in to hold things and to keep them secure. He's also talking about a battle bow and every ruler will come together. I'm kind of looking forward to the day when all rulers come together. Is that ever going to happen in our lifetime? The way it's going, it doesn't look it. However, when Jesus does come onto the scene, and we are going to get to that when we jump into chapter 13, 14, and 15, or chapter 13 and 14 in the end of the book, we're going to see the second coming of Jesus when he sets up his kingdom. And that's when it'll be ruled properly. It says in verse 5, And they shall, make, they shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets of the battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be put to shame. Back then, the horse or the chariot was a tank. Uh, battle today is a totally different battle than it was during World War II, that it was during World War I, that it was during the time of, you know, you go back to, uh, you know, the Roman Empire. You take a look at the Grecian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. Everything was close body contact. And now war is fought from a distance. I can sit on a ship out in the middle of the ocean, push a button, and 800 miles later, something blows up within six inches. That's a pretty good, accurate shot. He says, I'm going to strengthen the house of Judah. He will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside, and I will hear them. And we're seeing that today. That promise holds true today because everyone's going back to Israel. All the, everybody from Jewish background is heading back to Israel. Israel is getting overloaded with all, with all the people returning, and it's a good thing because that's what God said. Every Jew today, you ask them where they really want to be if they're outside of Israel, they say, we want to go back to Jerusalem. That's where we want to go. And God says, you're going to come back. This is a promise. He will save them. He will bring them back. He will, he will be as though he has never casted them aside. And in verse 7, those of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man. Now he's talking about the northern kingdom. Remember the kingdoms were divided. You had the northern kingdom when Jeroboam and Rehoboam, Rehoboam the son of Solomon and Jeroboam went up north and uh, Rehoboam stayed down south. It was always called Ephraim. Ephraim was up in the northern kingdom. Those of the northern kingdom, Ephraim, will be like a mighty man, and their hearts shall rejoice as if with wine. Yes, their children shall see it and be glad, and their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. And that's what he wants us to do. Just rejoice in the Lord. I don't want to. My life is horrible. My wife, my husband, my kids, my grandkids, my job, my whatever the circumstances may be. I know. A lot of things not to rejoice in. We've got to be honest. But there's joy in the Lord. And it's new every morning. And you get up and you say, okay, Lord, it's a new day. Whatever happened yesterday is done. Whatever's going on today is new. Praise God, I can rejoice in the Lord. He says, I will whistle for them and I will gather them. And I will redeem them. And they shall increase as they once increased. Bringing Israel back. And then we have more judgments here in verse 9. 
I will sow among them, among the peoples. I will sow them among the peoples. I'm sorry. I will sow them among the peoples, and they shall uh, remember me in far countries. They shall live together with their children, and they shall return. They're going to be scattered. They're going to be sent all over the world. We'll talk about that when we get into chapter 11 and 12. Titus of Vespasian, 70 AD, went in, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, killed over a million people, took 500 plus thousand captive. Terrible time of judgment for the nation of Israel. Took away the name Israel, called it Palestine, sent them away, and they were scattered around the world from 70 AD all the way up until May of 1948. He says, I'm going to bring them back and they shall return. And I will also bring them back from the land of Egypt. I will gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into, I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon and unt until no more room is found for them. He shall pass through the sea with affliction and strike the waves of the sea. All the depths of the river shall dry up and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down. The scepter of Egypt shall depart and I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall walk up and down in his name, says the Lord. Subtle. Chapter 11 gets really interesting. Chapter 12 gets wow. Take a look at this. Open your doors, O Lebanon, place of the mighty trees. That fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen because the mighty trees are ruined. Wail, oaks of Bashan. For the thick forest has come down. They sound the wailing of their shepherds. For there is glory in its ruins. And there is sound in the roaring lions. And the pride of Jordan is its ruins. He's talking about these nations around Israel that hated Israel. How they fell. And how they were burned. Now. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord my God. Feed the flock for slaughter. Whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say... Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their shepherds do not pity them. This is specifically talking about Titus Vespasian in 70 AD when he went in and destroyed Jerusalem. They took the 500 plus thousand people, sold them into slavery, and made a lot of money, the people of Israel. Those who tried to escape were killed, and those who stayed in the city were killed. And they just lied. They said, oh, blessed be the Lord, because I sold the nation of Israel. Now I am rich. And the people who are overseeing them don't have any pity on them whatsoever. The people of the, or the enemies of Israel were very vicious, very mean. He says, for I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. But indeed, I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of the king, of his king. And they shall attack the land and I will not deliver them from their hand. And so in 70 AD, the Lord basically let the nation of Israel fall the nation. They didn't stop existing. There are people today who say, well, Israel doesn't exist today. You know, uh, the church replaced Israel. It's called replacement theology. Don't ever believe that. Uh, you have uh, the 10 lost tribes of Israel. They don't know where 10 of them are. They only know where two of them are. If God loses things, we're in serious trouble. That's all I can say. So all these people who run around say, oh, God lost 10 tribes. You know, I, you know, I love the story in the New Testament of Mary and Joseph, just typical parents. And yet they had an interesting son to raise. His name was God, <laughs> under the name Jesus, Jesus Christ. And they go to Jerusalem. They leave Jerusalem after the holiday. And as they're out, they travel for a full day. Mary comes to Joseph and says, hey, where's Jesus? And of course, Joseph responds in husbandly manner. I thought, you knew where he was. They lost God. Can you imagine going before God and saying, Lord, I know you bestowed upon us the responsibility of taking care of your only begotten son. We're only earthly, and we lost him. They had to run back to Jerusalem, and they searched all over Jerusalem to find him. And when they find him, where do they find him? Doing his father's will in the temple, talking to the Pharisees and the leaders. But you can imagine the heart of Mary and Joseph just realizing, oh my goodness, the awesome responsibility of who God is has been granted to us. And the Lord holds all of that responsibility in his heart. And for us as believers, we need to make sure that we do not deviate from God. Because if we deviate from the Lord, he will come and find us. You're better off always staying with him than having him track you down. Because when he tracks you down, he's like a parent because the Bible tells us those who he loves, he chastises, he punishes. And he does it in a loving way. 
And anyone who's ever raised children knows what that's like. You don't want to punish them, and you know you always say, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And of course, as a kid, you're going, you liar. I know this is going to hurt me. I know that when you spank me, I'm going to feel it. I know that you're not feeling what I feel. And yet, they don't understand the heart of a parent because they don't want that child to do this, and yet the responsibility of a parent is to do that so that the child understands the difference. Oh, that we would love the Lord more. Amen to that. So I fed the flock for slaughter. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 is an interesting verse. It's a difficult verse. For I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them and their soul also abhorred me. They, every scholar has a different idea on who these three shepherds are. Some people say it's priest, king, and prophet. Those three offices have walked away from God. Other people just say that there were, you know, three shepherds who were overseeing Israel. We don't know who they were, but just look at it from the perspective of God. God was hoping that in the nation of Israel, someone would actually do what he asked him to do. And the Lord steps in and says, I dismissed him in one month, one month, and my soul loathed him because her soul abhorred me. Why does God loathe the soul that abhors him? Doesn't he love everyone? Well, he hates the sin. You know, Jesus was praying and he, said, and he told his father in John chapter 17, he said, Father, you've given me all these guys. You've given me the 12 and I have not lost any of them. Well, except for Judas, the son of perdition, the one who's gonna betray me. He is lost. I haven't lost him. He is lost. And because he is lost, there's nothing I can do for him. It's not the fact that God loathes them and hates them. It's the fact that because of the choice of man, God cannot get to them. Thus, in the book of Revelation, when you see the church, it says, you're hot or cold. If you're hot, you're doing good stuff. If you're cold, I can work with you. But if you're lukewarm, all I can do is vomit you out of my mouth. He says in verse 9, then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die. And what is perishing, perish. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. Uh, this actually happened in 70 AD when Vespasian surrounded the city of Jerusalem. They literally began eating their own children. And that's not the first time that happened. They actually did it earlier when they were surrounded by the Assyrians and they were surrounded. And the armies came in and they would eat their own flesh. Terrible, horrible time. He says, I took my staff beauty. I took my staff or the, the, the beauty or grace and I cut it in two that I may break the covenant which I had made with all the people. Jesus Christ was cut off, the staff. He was put on a cross and he died. He rose again, but the people rejected him. I look forward to the day when the whole nation of Israel repents and actually starts following the Lord. They realize they have that awakening. Aha, it was him. And he goes on in verse 11, so it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said to them, if it's agreeable to you, give me my wages. And if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wage 30 pieces of silver. Now, what is the significance of 30 pieces of silver? Yeah, yeah it's a cost of a slave. If my ox gored one of your servants to death, I have to restore to you, the owner of that slave, 30 pieces of silver. When Jesus Christ was betrayed, who betrayed him? Judas. And what did he do? He went in, he made a deal with the guys, and he said, hey, I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn this guy in. You know, how much you pay me? 30 pieces. I don't remember the dollar amount that was actually equated to. But it's interesting. Look at this. I took my staff in verse 10, beauty or grace, Jesus Christ, and I broke it in two that I may break my covenant with the peoples. And you know what? The Lord was watching that day and was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Now, it's an interesting thing because now what happened to that money in the New Testament? Judas, now if you remember the story, Judas led the priests and the crowd to Gethsemane where Jesus was. And as Jesus was praying, these guys showed up with staves and swords and all these things, right? How did they know who Jesus was? Well, Judas went up and kissed him. And when he kissed him, Jesus said, are you going to betray me, friend? Friend? He called him friend. And so they arrested Jesus and they took him away. Well, Judas started feeling bad. So you read in the Gospels what he did. He, go, he goes back to the priest. And he says, I have betrayed 
innocent blood. It's interesting, every single person who was trying to convict Jesus in Scripture, every single person who said he's guilty came back later and said he was innocent. The executioner standing at the base of the cross said, well, this guy was innocent. There was no reason for him to die, and yet he's dead now. So Judas goes back to the priest, and he says, here's your money. You got to take it back. And what do they say? That's blood money. We can't do a thing with it, Judas. His blood be on you. And so Judas throws the money down. 30 pieces of silver. And you, can, and you can picture this. They're standing in their, their you know, marble floored room in the temple and Judas shows up and you can hear the silver coins scatter across the floor as the bag opens when he throws it down. And he runs away broken and guilty. Not repentant, just guilty. And he's weeping. And what happened? Judas goes out and he hangs himself. Bible says that when he hung himself, the rope broke and he fell headlong and his insides became his outsides. He burst open. But then the, the, the priest had a problem. And the priest was like, what do we do with this blood money? He gave it back to us. We can't do anything with it. It's blood money. We used it in betrayal of an innocent man. So I got an idea. Let's buy a potter's field. And that's what they did. And 500, almost 500 years before that time in the priest, look at verse 13. The Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the prince or the princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and I threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter because they bought the potter's field. Now, what was a potter's field for? It was for waste. It was for waste. The potter's out there working, and whenever it didn't work and it broke or it shattered, he would take that clay and throw it into the field. That field eventually became a place of burial for strangers, for people who died because people who couldn't afford it, people who were like, oh, man, we just found the dead body here. What do we do with it? Who is he? I don't know. You know, it's Jane Doe or John Smith or whatever his name is, and they didn't have anybody else. They would take him to the potter's field and bury them there. 500, almost 500 years before that event, Zechariah is prophesying this, that Jesus Christ was going to be cut off, put on a cross, and 30 pieces of silver was going to be used to purchase a potter's field. Now you tell me prophecy is fictitious. Come on. People need to realize. The Lord was very specific when he called a prophet. He said, if the prophet prophesies and it comes true, he's a true prophet of God. But if a prophet prophesies and it doesn't come true, there's only one thing to do. Take that prophet outside the city, stone him to death, and bury him under a pile of rocks because he's a useless piece of meat lying to the people. And I've always said churches would be a whole lot different today if that was still in place. I'm not condoning it. But I'm saying there'd be a lot of pastors who would change their tune right away if I said something that was lying to you. Now, he took his other staff and, and I, I, I cut into my other staff bonds. Um, and, and when you take a look at the word bonds, it actually means unity. They're tied together. They're, they're pieced together. I, I took this unity and I broke it. And I broke the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Where did Jesus Christ come from? Which tribe? Judah. And the Lord said to me, Next, take for yourself the implements of the foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those who are broken, nor feed those who still stand. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves into pieces. Now we're moving into a very unique time frame. What we're reading here from verse 15 down to verse 17 has not happened yet. Because take a look at the next verse. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. The Lord says, I'm going to raise up a shepherd. I'm going to raise up someone who's going to come. He's going to act like he's the shepherd, but he is not going to feed. He's not going to care. He's not going to heal. He's not going to care for anybody in there. He's going to eat the food that's available to them because he is only in it for himself. Who is this worthless shepherd? Now, it's the Antichrist, yeah. Here's the thing, though. 
And I've said this many, many times, whenever I talk about the Antichrist, I don't like the name Antichrist for this guy, the Antichrist. It is a title for him, the Antichrist. But John the Apostle, when he was writing, he talks about many Antichrists. Read 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, both of his, all the epistles that he wrote, he talks about Antichrist, plural. Many will come. And, and, and there are 33 names in the Old Testament of the Antichrist and 13 names in the New Testament of the Antichrist. I'm not going to go through all of them, but this is one of them, the worthless shepherd. That's one of the titles of the Antichrist. Now, who was the first one to talk about the Antichrist? Well, it goes all the way back to old time prophets, but Jesus Christ spoke about this when he was here. When Jesus was on this earth, he mentioned uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, he said this, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Oh, look at that. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and I will save many. So we're going to see that. Jesus spoke about that in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 5. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, there shall rise false Christ and false prophets who shall show great signs and wonders in so much that, if it were possible, they would even deceive the elect. Jesus told the religious leaders in John chapter 5, verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you shall receive. So the Antichrist. A lot of speculation on who the Antichrist is. People have asked, who is the Antichrist? You know, what is the Antichrist? Now when you read this, Road of the Worthless Shepherd, who leaves the flock, a sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall be, he shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. Now, do me a favor. Go to the end of the book. Just before you get to the book of Maps, go to the book of Revelation. Turn with me to chapter 6. Book of Revelation, chapter 6. <clears throat> John saw the vision. Angel there, he's got a scroll, and in that scroll, written inside and outside, seven seals on that scroll. And now it was asked, who's going to open the scroll and break the seals of the scroll? And no man in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was there to come up and do that. And John wept bitterly. The angel came to him and said, John, why are you weeping? Behold, watch this. So in verse 1 of chapter 6, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, because the Lamb of God came, Jesus Christ, when he opened one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. First seal white horse shows up. On that horse is a guy. And that guy is riding this white horse. He's got a bow. And he's got a crown. And it was given to him. And he was conquering and to conquer. What does that mean? This is the initiation of the first representation of the Antichrist. He shows up with a bow. Notice what's missing. No arrows. So he comes with strength. I got a bow. No arrows to shoot. Is it possible that when you take a look back in Zechariah and it says, a sword shall be against his arm, against his right eye, his arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. Is it possible that he can't shoot it so he shows up and he's only got one arm to hold a bow and he can't draw the arrow? Very possibly. He shows up onto the scene. And when he shows up onto the scene, he comes with authority. Is it going to be a sudden thing? Is it going to be something where he shows up and says, I'm the Antichrist? Absolutely not. Matter of fact, we'll go a few for chapters farther in chapter 13 in Revelation. <clears throat> chapter 13 in the book of Revelation, we have a little bit more description. So John... He stood on the, uh, uh, on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. And the beast, which I, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. The dragon is always Satan. 
And he goes on, he says, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. Back to Zechariah, sword blinded in his right eye, totally withered arm. Mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. How easy is it to be deceived? Well, here's a guy who's dead. Somebody attacked him with a sword right across the face, right across his arm, cut the tendons in his arm. They put it back together. He can't use it. He's limp in the arm and blind in his right eye. What does that mean? At first, when I read that, I thought, how can the worthless shepherd be a position of the Antichrist? Right after I asked that question, I was watching the news, and this was years ago. Over in Iran, there was an assassination attempt on a dignitary in Iran. And while this assassination attempt was done, how do most people today do an assassination? They shoot someone, right? No, this guy attacked this guy with a sword. Wailing and flinging a sword. What are we seeing in subways over in Europe today? What are we seeing people doing? Guys running around with axes and swords. You know why? Because I can just pull it out. If I can't carry a gun, I'll carry a machete. Interesting, isn't it? And so when you take a look at chapter 13, this Antichrist, and the people worship the dragon, Satan, who gave authority to the beast, the Antichrist, and they worship the beast saying, who was like the beast? Who was able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth. Look at this, speaking great things and blasphemies and was given authority to continue for 42 months, which is three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe and every nation. And what we see there in chapter 13, bounce back to the book of Zechariah. What we see there in chapter 13 is the Antichrist showing up, speaking great words. People are going, oh, this guy's a great orator. He's got the words to speak peace and strength to us. He's giving us hope. Why is it that in times of calamity... Now we kind of shift gears here. Why is it that during times of calamity, people will listen to anyone? Let's take some history. Back in the 30s, a guy came up into power in Germany named Adolf. Germany was in dire, dire bankruptcy. And Hitler showed up and he gave everyone what they wanted to hear. Take vacations, we'll provide bread, we'll do all these things. And people followed Hitler. Go back, Mussolini, Stalin, Lenin, Pol Pot. All these guys, whenever calamity happens. Now, what is going to cause a major calamity? Hmm, think about this. Oh, is it war, nuclear war, rumors of war? No, Jesus in Matthew 24 said, you're going to hear of war, rumors of war, pestilence, famine. Don't worry about those things. They have to happen. Those aren't really the issue. The issue is this. When you see, as spoken by Daniel the prophet, the abomination of desolation in the temple, that's when things begin to happen. What's he talking about? Well, the Antichrist shows up at the beginning of the tribulation. And at the beginning of the tribulation period, he tells all the world there needs to be peace in the Middle East. What have we been fighting for since 1948? Peace in the Middle East. And if we're looking for peace in the Middle East, guess what happened? 1948, right after Israel was announced, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan attacked Israel. What are they attacking? An empty, torn down city that hasn't been inhabited for years since 70 AD. Just people kind of, you know, nomads living out there. Now all these people are back. 1948, Jordan, Egypt, and Syria. Jordan took the West Bank. Egypt took the Sinai. And Syria took the Golan Heights. And so now Israel suddenly got smaller. In 1948, they're brand new. Well, 1967, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria, in the Six-Day War, go to battle again. The Jews got back Sinai, the West Bank, and they united Jerusalem, and they took the Golan Heights. 1973, the Yom Kippur War. They attacked on Yom Kippur, thinking that Israel won't even be ready. And this was an interesting time. The Jews got the whole Sinai Peninsula, and they captured what was a third Egyptian army in Egypt. And they were still moving, and, and it wasn't until Kissinger showed up and said, whoa, peace accord talk, let's, let's, let's stop this. And, and they were like, no, no, we're going. They wanted to go all the way into and attack Damascus. That's how far in they wanted to go. Now, this Antichrist, he shows up. 
A lot of questions. First one is, who is the Antichrist? When does he show up? Will we see the Antichrist? Now, this is where it gets kind of like, hmm. Turn with me to the book of 2 Thessalonians. Book of 2 Thessalonians. <laughs> in the book of 2 Thessalonians, Paul... Yeah, we're not in 2 Thessalonians. We're doing this on Sunday morning. We're still in 1 Thessalonians. Yeah. Oh, so I'm going to give you guys a highlight tonight and then go in depth on Sunday morning. Anyway, uh, 2 Thessalonians, look there in chapter 2. Second is two, right? Now, why am I still in one? There we go. Now, brethren, in verse one, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together with him, you ask not to be soon shaken. We ask you, don't be soon shaken in mind or in trouble by spirit or by word or by letter as if as though the day of Christ had come. Don't worry about it. The rapture hasn't happened yet because what is the day of Christ in this case? It's the gathering of the saints to him. That's rapture of the church. And then he says this, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, what is that day? The rapture, will not come unless the falling away comes first. We're not going to talk about that. We'll talk about that later. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Who's the man of sin? The Antichrist. That's another name for him. That's one of the 13 New Testament names in man of sin. Son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is the abomination of Daniel, spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, that Jesus spoke about in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke. He opposes and exalts himself. Now, he says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And, now look at verse 6. I'm going to explain this the best I can, but there will always be people who don't agree with what I'm about to explain. And that's okay. I'm fine. And I'll explain why in a minute. And now you know what is restraining. What does restraining mean? Holding back. If I take you and I put handcuffs behind your back and I haul you off to the jail and I close that jail, are you restrained? And the answer is yes. Can you get out? No. What is the only way you can get out? Well, if you get out legally or you try to break out. Don't recommend breaking out. It's never a good idea. You cannot get out until you are relieved. You are allowed to go out. So you, now you know what is restraining. Now look at this. Now this is, an, this is an important phrase. That he may be revealed in his own time. That he may be revealed. Who is he being revealed? This is another picture of the Antichrist. So when you read this, and now you know what is restraining. So something is restraining the Antichrist from being revealed because the Antichrist has to be revealed in his own time. But he cannot be revealed because he's being restrained. Because look at verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Okay. Let's read that again. The mystery of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so. Who is he who is now restraining? Who is that he? Now, the who? The Holy Spirit. All right, the Holy Spirit. Good. Where does the Holy Spirit live in the believers? In the believers, in the church. So when you read this, now you know what is restraining. The Antichrist cannot be revealed because he is being restrained from being revealed because lawlessness that is already at work isn't fully at work yet because there is still this thing called the church on this planet. With the church on the planet, who lives in the church? The Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is living in the church, what is the voice of the Holy Spirit? The voice of the Holy Spirit should be the church of Jesus Christ. So if the Antichrist is being restrained because the church of Jesus Christ is restraining him from being revealed, then that means the Holy Spirit within the church is now holding the Antichrist unknown. We don't know who he is. We don't know where he is. We don't know what he is. I believe he's alive. I just don't know anything about him. Now, Let's finish the verse. Only he who now restrains will do so. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit living within the church, the voice of the church, holding down morality. Will do so until he is taken out of his way. When the church is raptured, does the Holy Spirit need to live in us anymore? No. Why? Because we're already now glorified. You get saved, you're justified. 
You go through a transformation. You're justified as a believer when you get saved. You're in sanctification process as we live. Once you're glorified, the Holy Spirit has finished his job. And we are now in the presence of the Lord, fully glorified, not needing the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. But where does the Holy Spirit reside after the church is left? The Holy Spirit still stays on earth because you know how many people get saved on earth? Almost every single Jew and millions upon millions upon millions of Gentiles. And how do people get saved? Only by the Holy Spirit. Because that's what Jesus said. One man waters, one man casts seeds, but the Holy Spirit brings the increase. So when you read these verses, you cannot say, well, the Holy Spirit leaves the planet when the church is raptured. No, the Holy Spirit stays here. But it's a different kind of presentation of the Holy Spirit here. So let's just reword this. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until the remnant of the church is taken out of the way because the Holy Spirit is what restrains him and the restrainer lives in the church. And so when the church is removed, every single voice of morality is now gone in the moment and the twinkling of an eye. Now suddenly, all of those who are left behind go, um, I think there was something to that whole church thing I remember. And they're going to go to church and try to find people. And I pray in the name of Jesus, ain't none of you guys going to be left here. Amen. I pray that. Now, you may not agree with that, but that's how I read it. Now, the lawless one in verse 8 will be revealed who the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, who is the Antichrist? Let me just put it as simple as I can. I think there's a very Greek term that we can use. So if you ask the question, who's the Antichrist? Here's, here's my response in the Greek. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Because if the church of Jesus Christ is raptured, I don't need to be looking for the Antichrist. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, it's the Pope, it's the president, it's the king, it's the princess. Yeah, and all these people, you know, they, they pick out who they are. You know, yeah, some people say it's Bill Gates. Some people thought it was Bill Clinton. Other people thought it was, you know, Barack Obama. Other people think it was the king of England. And it's like, oh, Charles, you know, the Pope. It's him. He's the Antichrist. I don't care. Because I'm not going to be here to have to worry about the seals being opened when Jesus Christ peels that first seal off and, re and now releases because the church is gone and says, all right, here's the Antichrist. He's on the scene. Go back to the book of Zechariah. His right eye shall be totally blinded and his, against his, his arm shall be completely withered and people are going to worship him and think, oh, now here's the thing, guys. We are so far behind. I wanted to get into chapter 13, or excuse me, chapter 12, because when, when you take a look at it, there are seven in that days mentioned. In that day, in that day, seven times. In that, what day? It's the day of Jesus Christ. That's, and, and then we... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there is next week. Unless the Antichrist is going to be revealed. <laughs> now, here's the thing. With all of this, we see Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. We see him as cut off. We see him as the redeemer. We see 30 pieces of silver paid. We see the Antichrist rolling onto the scene where the church has been removed, and now he can come. He comes with eloquence, he comes with strength, and he comes with boldness. When is he really going to be revealed as the Antichrist, though? That's the abomination of desolation. He's here for the full seven years. Seventy, year, or 70 weeks have been determined upon your nation and your holy city, he told Daniel, talking about the nation of Israel. Sixty-nine of those seven weeks have already been fulfilled. The 70th one is when this covenant, this treaty, this taxon in the, in, the, in the Hebrew is signed. And the nation of Israel can build their temple. Why do they want their temple? Because they rejected Jesus Christ. They have to worship some way. They haven't been in Jerusalem since 1948. They don't even have a temple now. They can throw this temple up in probably five months. They got tilt-up technology. They got it all prefab. They're ready to go. They have the blueprints made up. They got all the implements and they got all the furniture. They got it all ready to go. It's in place. They just need permission to do it. The only problem is, if you take a look 
in Jerusalem, there's a 17-acre piece of property. This 17-acre is called the Temple Mound. And what's on the Temple Mound? Something called the Dome of the Rock Mosque, third holiest site in all of Islam. Third. So if they're the third holiest, what's the first one? Well, we know that that's where they go to pray over in um, Mecca, right? So they go to Mecca and they do their prayer. And every year someone gets trampled and they die. I don't understand that, but that's what they do. So if it's the third holiest site, why do they care? Because if Mecca is their site, why don't they make that their site? No, they got to go over to Israel and build the Dome of the Rock Mosque. That's where what's his name went up into... Yeah, Muhammad, um, Allah land. You know, you went, woo, there he went. Um, Lord, forgive me, I apologize for that. <laughs> that was so bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's where they went up. So if it's the third most holiest site, why do they care? Just to annoy the Jews, that's why. Three religions primarily in Israel. First one, Judaism. Second one, Christianity. Third one is Islam. Then you have a bunch of other factions there, the cults and different things like that. But here's the thing. We, the church, are supposed to be the truth. We're not supposed to be a worthless shepherd presenting lies. Now, is the church in a dire strait right now? I believe it is. I think the church is in a dire strait. I think it's uh, 60%. 59%, 58% are starting to lose it. The churches are falling away. I read an article in Fox News. Fox News. You read Fox News? Yeah, okay, I read Fox News. But it said this. It said the church in America is dying faster than it was in Europe. That, my friends, is a problem. Less Americans today want anything to do with God. Thus, the necessity of knowing about Christ, his prophecy, his word, and his truth. So what do we do? Well, I think the first thing I got to do is change the times for Wednesday night. <laughs> I, I need more than an hour now because, you know, we've been covering these prophecies all the way from Jeremiah and now we're in Zechariah, so we might as well move into the big ones later. We might as well go back into Revelation and Daniel and cover those. But here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we don't stand up as the remnant and speak truth to a world in need, we're not gonna have an impact. We're already losing our impact. We've either losing it or we've lost it. Very few churches today teach the Bible. Very few churches today can explain apologetics. Very few churches today can explain doctrine. Very few churches today can explain what Jesus is, who Jesus is, why he was, the way he was while he was here. Very few. And yet people flock to churches by the droves, thousands upon thousands of people, to listen to rhetoric that is the most ungodly, deceitful lie you can hear. Go through an entire service, not even hear about the blood of Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, not even hear about the gospel, not even hear about a beaten body, devoured by whips and beatings on a cross. Can't do that. No, that'll offend people. Can't talk about hell because if you talk about hell, someone's going to get offended. I get offended because people get offended. I'm so fed up with offended people that it's offending me. <laughs> and I'm like, this has got to stop. Let's stand up and be men and women of God and let them know the truth. Because if they're willing to offend us, why can't we offend them and go, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> smallest violin in the world, whatever that, you know, I don't know. It's like, let's just reason together and speak truth to the guys and the gangs out there. Amen. All right, so let's, let's stand as we close in prayer. Father, we come before you. Lord, we can actually go on for a lot longer, but Heavenly Father, your word is your word is your word. It's authoritative, it's power, it's strength, it's truth. It cuts to the bone, cuts to the marrow, and it tears us into the life that we need to be because we need to be broken before you, humbled before you, encouraged before you, built up before you. We need to be obedient before you. We need to look to your word all the time. 
And this world needs salvation. This world needs to be able to look at Jesus and say, he is Messiah. Because there is going to come a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Yet, there is going to be a lot of people who claim that where it's too late. Because it has to be done here today while we live. The Bible tells us that when you confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart, that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. You confess your sins as remission of sin. The burden is removed. And Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would just touch us as a church, empower us, Lord, to speak the truth, to let people know what it means to be a believer. And so, Father, as we walk out of here today, I pray, Father God, that this message touches someone's heart and they just right now collapse and say, Jesus, you're my Lord. Driving down the road, Jesus, you're my Lord. Sitting in their house, Jesus, you're my Lord. Help me to obey you. So all these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God, that all-powerful being who redeemed sinful mankind and offered salvation when believed. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week for God's message. Next week, come back and we will continue to grow and hear from God's word. If you've not received Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that you can know that you're going to heaven when you die. It's putting your complete faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. His death, burial, and resurrection made the complete payment for our sins. So if you've made a decision for Christ or would like to know more about our church, you can contact us through the telephone number that's down below or the website address. So until then, may God bless you and keep you in his word.